so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It's the 22nd of September 2007. Saturday night on Sydney's iconic Oxford Street, the home of the city's best LGBTQ nightlife. Clubs and bars heave with regulars and visitors alike, friends celebrating, hopeful singles looking for a hookup, brides to be in their hands, drag performers and DJs. Oxford Street attracts a mix of punters from all walks of life. And this slice of urban Sydney is their gathering place, where they're unafraid to be themselves. The beating heart of it all is a gay nightclub at the southern end of Oxford Street called Ark. It's around 10.30pm when 20-year-old Matthew Levison, or Maddie as his friends know him, arrives at Ark with his 43-year-old boyfriend, Michael Atkins. Things don't really get exciting around here until after midnight, but Matt is savvy about spending his hard-earned cash and he doesn't want to fork out for an entry fee during the busy peak. So they make an appearance early to get a free entry stamp. It'll act as a fast pass of sorts to re-enter the club when it's pumping in a few hours' time. They head to a friend's for some drinks a couple of suburbs away from Oxford Street's Darlinghurst to Alexandria before making their way back to Ark after midnight. It's around 2am when Matt and Michael are seen leaving the club. But Maddie doesn't want to go home. He texts a friend that Mike needs to get over himself. 23 years his senior, Michael is said to be a jealous and controlling man. Matt's friends know he's unsure in his relationship. Matt says he's even thinking of moving to London for a fresh start. But the 20-year-old will never book those flights or see his friends again. It will be a decade before the man who knows what happened to Matt Levison leads police to his body. The same man who walks free to this day. What happened on Sunday? Which time did you wake up? Uh, in the afternoon sometime, about two o'clock or something, two or three. And then we sort of just had, you know, lazy Sunday afternoon, really. Um, I fell asleep in the lounge, you know, watching sort of TV and woke up a little while later and he wasn't at home. So I sent him a text and said, you know, where are you, whatever. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about the disappearance of Matthew Levison and an unprecedented 10-year investigation to find his remains and the truth about what happened to him in the early hours of the 23rd of September 2007, the hours after he left a nightclub with his boyfriend, Michael Atkins. Michael's aversion to telling the truth about that night would torment Matthew's family see a murder acquittal, a coronial inquisition and an historic immunity deal. Author and Four Corners reporter Grace Tobin followed this case extensively and worked closely with Matthew's family while writing her book, Deal With The Devil. Grace joins me now to discuss this case. And just a note, this episode does contain some discussion of drug abuse. Listener discretion is advised. I want to start with what we know about Maddie. What was he like? Yeah, I almost feel like I know Matt myself. And I know that sounds ridiculous because I no, have never met him. But through Mark and Faye and through so many of Matt's friends who I've interviewed and got to know personally over the years, Matt is just someone who was 
infectious in the best possible way to anyone who met him. His smile really did light up a room. Like if you see a photo of Matt, that's the first thing that you notice. And he was such a playful person. He loved his fruity cocktails and he loved cooking. And he really just had this energy about him that anyone who met him just loved him and fell in love with him. So, you know, he was 20 years old. He was really in the prime of his life. He was young. He was gorgeous. He was pretty new to the dating scene at the time. So he was out nightclubbing. He was doing all the things that a 20-year-old should be doing. How did he meet Michael Atkins? This is, you know, a 20-year-old in the prime of his life. He has all these interests and passions and he's just beginning to get out there and express himself. How does he meet a 43-year-old? Yeah, interestingly, Matt actually first started talking with Michael Atkins when he was only 17 years old. So he was still in high school. It was actually the same year that Matthew came out to his parents as gay. He told his best friends that he was gay. Everyone was so supportive of him. And he mentioned even to his best friend at that time that he was talking to some hotties. And as it turned out, Michael Atkins was one of them. They were talking online. It was through a website called Gay Matchmaker, which I guess if you think the kind of Tinder or Grinder of the day, that was where he sort of started exploring his sexuality. But it actually wasn't until the middle of 2006, so almost two years later that they actually met in person, they arranged to meet at a nightclub in Sydney. And that was sort of the first time that they saw each other in the flesh. And then from there, things moved really quickly. Matthew moved in with Atkins quite soon. And they started this really sort of full-blown relationship. Did Atkins know Matt's real age when they initially connected online? As you mentioned, he was underage. Yeah, look, I have no doubt. And to be honest, I think that was the draw card for Atkins because of the research that I did into Atkins' past. This was something that he was doing all the time. One of his first boyfriends, Atkins' first boyfriends, after he himself came out as gay, well, actually at the time he hadn't even come out as gay. He'd been dating a lot of women through his 20s. He even had a seven-year relationship with one particular woman. And then he started exploring his sexuality. And one of the first guys that he dated was a schoolboy who was 17 and in a very similar situation to Matt, just starting to get out there himself. And so this is a pattern with Atkins. He dated and who knows, still is dating really young guys. What do we know about those relationships, that earlier one that you've mentioned with a schoolboy then his relationship eventually with Matt Levison. What kind of a partner was Michael Atkins? Well, look, I think when it came to Matthew in particular, from the friends that I spoke to, from the people who knew their relationship the best, and I have to say that Atkins himself is a pretty mysterious person in a lot of ways, but certainly from what people witnessed, Mark and Faye certainly describe the relationship as quite controlling. One of Matthew's other good friends who he worked with, Carrie Ann, she certainly described a lot of conversations with Matt where it would come up that Atkins was very possessive of him. The other thing that just kept coming up so much with so many friends was that Atkins was continuously asking and putting pressure on Matthew to have threesomes with other men and other young guys. And so this was a point of tension in their relationship that Matthew didn't really want to do that, whereas Atkins was becoming quite forceful about the idea. In terms of how Atkins was making his money, he had a day job, but what was the role of GHB in his relationship with Matt? Can you tell me about the drugs. Yeah, sure. And it's definitely a sensitive 
kind of controversial area of this case. It's really difficult for Matthew's parents to have had to sit through all the ins and outs of this side of things. But unfortunately, the reality is that as a couple, they were involved in selling the party drug GHB. And so essentially, they would sort of package it up at home themselves and use those little soy sauce fish containers. And so they would package that up in the sink at home, and then they would take that out to nightclubs and on sell it. It seems like it began as something that they just thought was a good opportunity to fund their lifestyle, essentially, that they were out partying or their friends were out partying. So this was a way of making some fast cash on the side. And it certainly seems like Atkins was the driver of it. He felt very motivated by how lucrative it was becoming. On the 22nd of September 2007, Michael and Matthew head to ARC, the iconic Sydney gay nightclub. Were they there for a social night out or were they there to sell drugs? To be honest, it was a bit of both. I think their main motivation of going out and certainly Matt's main motivation was to meet friends, to dance, to have a great time. And that's certainly what the witnesses who were there that night told me was that Matt was having a great time. He was laughing, he was dancing, he was taking selfies with friends. Uh, They were there to also meet up with Matt's older brother, Pete, at the nightclub. So they were having a normal Saturday night out, it seems. But on the side of that, there was also drug selling happening. And you see that in some of the text messages that happen later on in the night. So it's around 2 a.m. It seems like there's tension between Matt and Atkins at that point in the night and there's text messages to that effect. So Atkins is asking, where are you, Matt? And we need to go to the car to get more ecstasy so that we can sell more drugs in the nightclub. And that's really where we see a little glimpse into their night through CCTV. What does that CCTV show us? It's 2 a.m., their night's wrapping up. Is that the last time that Matt is seen alive? Well, it's the last time that anyone other than Michael Atkins sees him alive. So the CCTV was really crucial to the investigation. It shows the pair leaving the nightclub. You can see Matthew striding out in front of Michael Atkins. Matthew clearly doesn't seem happy with his older partner. And then Those text messages around 3 a.m. show that friends are looking for him and saying, where are you? Matt actually replies to one of the text messages. It's 3.19. He says, Mike's having a cry. He's taking me home. He won't let me stay. He uses some colourful language to describe Atkins, you know, says that he needs to get over himself. And the friend replies, oh, well, I'm sure you'll be all right which clearly Matt wasn't. It was the last time that anyone sees him. He's driven off by Michael Atkins. Michael Atkins is behind the wheel and he's driven off essentially to his death. In that gap between 2 a.m. when we see them leave ARC and after 3 a.m. when those messages are sent, Michael comes back into ARC presumably to sell more drugs. Do we know what Matt was doing where he was in that time? No, it's one of the huge mysteries of the case. What about Matt's brother? You've mentioned he was with them at ARC. At what point do they become separated? Did his brother give you any indication that he was feeling concerned about Maddie on that night? Yeah, so Pete is in the nightclub with Matt. Pete really describes Matt sort of being out of sorts in some way. So I think it seems clear to anyone who's around Matt that he has taken something potentially, that he is kind of bouncing around, but he's not completely there at the same time. So I think Pete had some concern for his brother, but it was one of those situations where there was tension between Matt and Atkins. And so Matt was also kind of ignoring his brother as part of that. And so there wasn't concern in the sense that Pete thought something bad was going to happen. 
The next day, everyone has presumed Matt's gone home with Michael Atkins, albeit a little disgruntled that his night stopped earlier than he'd hoped. What does the version of events from Michael Atkins tell us about the hours and days that follow? Yeah, so really the web of lies begins almost from the morning after that nightclub evening. Atkins is texting Matt as if he has no idea what has happened. Things like, morning baby, I woke up and you're not there. Just let me know where you are, please. Miss you with lots of kisses. Baby, will you please call me? What's up? So these are all messages coming through to Matthew's phone. He then appears to start working on fabricating this whole story that Matt on the Saturday night had gone back out with his friends to the club and must have stayed over at one of their places. He's texting Matt's friends. He's texting his own friends asking, oh, did Matt go out with you? Those same friends are obviously very confused and they're texting Matt's phone asking, well, what's going on? So this goes on for a couple of days. The Tuesday rolls round and that's the first day that Matthew was due at work. And so he has a very close work colleague, Kerry Ann, who instantly thinks something's up because Matthew never calls in sick. And if he was to call in sick, she would be the first to know that he wasn't going to be showing that day. So she raises the alarm by calling the Leveson household. And this is the first time the family know anything is wrong. And so Mark and Faye, the parents, they track down Michael Atkins' phone number and Atkins tells her, I don't know where Matt is, that he woke up on the Sunday morning, Matt had gone, and oh, Atkins didn't think to tell them anything before now because he'd gone missing before. On the flip side, Mark and Faye are just beside themselves. They think this is completely out of character for Matt, so they're calling around all his friends and they immediately want to make a missing persons report. Atkins is reluctant, almost being completely uncooperative even at this stage, and it's in a heated phone call that Mark, Matthew's father, says to him, you need to get to the station right now. The story that Michael Atkins had come up with about Matt having gone back out, having met back up with friends, that he wasn't alarmed because this was something that happened often, that Matthew disappeared. Is any of that true? There was this one time very early on in their relationship, in hindsight in their relationship, because Mark and Faye, Matt's parents, didn't even really know they were together and Matt went missing. But as it turned out, he was with Atkins. So he was a young guy who had just started dating someone and he went missing, but he just hadn't told his parents where he was. So that is completely different to this scenario. So Matthew is reported missing. What does Atkins tell police in those early stages of the initial investigation? Yeah, so pretty much lies <laughs> and nothing but lies. His story just keeps changing at this point. So Mark and Faye learn really the details through a kind of informal interview with police at those early stages reporting him missing. And Atkins tells police that Matt and he had gone out clubbing on the Saturday night. He said he wanted to leave early and Matt didn't want to. He reported to them that we got home and we didn't say much to each other. We woke up the next morning and everything seemed fine. I was talking to him. He was talking to me between eight and nine that night, which is the Sunday, was the last time he saw Matt. And Atkins tells the cops that Matthew had plans to go out with friends in the city. We know now that Matthew was already dead by this point. So this is completely fabricated. And You know, it's the day after making that police report in some ways that the most extraordinary thing happens. And that is Atkins has reported his boyfriend missing and then he travels up to Newcastle two hours north of Sydney to have sex with a 23-year-old man who he'd been talking to online for a few months at that stage. So while Mark and Faye are out literally searching for their son, he's already off having sex with someone else. When does the version of events presented to police and Mark and Faye begin to unravel? At what point is Atkins suspect number one? 
Yeah, so it was fairly early on in the scheme of things. And the major piece of the puzzle that comes about is on the Thursday. So the nightclub's on the Saturday night. This is on the Thursday. A police patrol car comes across Matt's missing car at a sports oval. And so that then sort of sparks a proper investigation. Up until that point, it was just a missing persons report that really wasn't being taken that seriously by police. I think about that all the time myself, that perhaps if it had been a young 20-year-old blonde, gorgeous girl with a much older boyfriend who'd been missing for four or five days, that things would have been really escalated by police and even by the media. But for Matt, there was really very little effort at those early stages to do much about his disappearance. Does that tell us anything about public attitudes towards queer people at that time? I definitely think it made a difference in this case. I think there were some good cops who worked on this case from the beginning and I think they tried despite some attitudes in the community. But I do think on a whole, when you look at the Levison case, you know, this is a gorgeous young man who's disappeared in highly suspicious circumstances. And the evidence is mounting against his much older partner who's acting suspiciously. So I always couldn't help but think looking at everything that if this had been this young, gorgeous 20-year-old woman whose much older partner was acting suspiciously, it first of all, it would have been in the media overnight. Like it would have been one of those cases that everyone became obsessed with and so therefore all the resources from a policing point of view would have been thrown at it as well. I think the truth is Matt being gay has made a difference to how this case has been treated by the police, by the media, by the public, potentially even by a jury down the track. Who knows? So it's the car that then sparks a kind of full investigation. And the car becomes a huge part of the evidence in this case and a huge reason as to why Atkins becomes a suspect. And it's not so much what was found in the car, but what was missing. So when police open the boot of Matthew's car, there's sort of frayed wires in the back, which turns out to be what was a boombox or a big kind of speaker that Matt had installed in the back of his car. He loved playing his tunes really, really loudly from it. So that was something that even his workmate, Kerry Ann, said, He drove off on the Saturday night with his music blaring from his car. By the Thursday, the car turns up and the boombox is gone. And so it looks like it's been ripped out of the back quite quickly and with no care or attention to why it had been ripped out. And in its place, in the boot, is a bit of paper and it's a receipt from Bunnings Warehouse. How is Michael Atkins connected to that Bunnings receipt? So the police take that receipt, they look at the time stamp, and they also look at the items that were purchased. And this is the chilling part of that receipt. It shows that what was bought on the Sunday, so the day after the nightclub, the day after Matthew's seen for the last time alive, and it shows that on the Sunday a Matic, which is essentially like a pick, a big kind of digging instrument that sort of has a flat edge on it, that was purchased along with gaffer tape. And so the police obviously get straight over to Bunnings and ask for the CCTV footage to show who on earth purchased these items and why was the boot of Matthew's car empty with, you know, these items on on a receipt. Lo and behold, the footage shows a guy in a pink polo shirt. He sort of has shorts on and he's at the counter paying for these items. And you zoom in and you can see clear as day, it's Michael Atkins. And, you know, I still can picture it in my mind, the footage as he walks out the door and there's this mattock swinging by his leg. And he's just there with all these customers, families on a Sunday shopping for home renos and that kind of thing. And he's just there in broad daylight buying these items. 
How quickly then is he brought into police custody and questioned and how does he explain being in Bunnings, buying those items? Yeah, so he's brought in to be interviewed fairly quickly after that. Police are obviously extremely suspicious about why on earth he's in Bunnings buying these things, but also why his story doesn't match up with what he's told the missing persons report. So when he's interviewed by police, and it is an extraordinary interview from start to finish, I mean, the denials are just thick and fast, everything. He just completely denies in the face of what the evidence is. You know, he's asked directly, did you purchase a pick and gaffer tape from Bunnings? To which he says, no, I don't think so. This is on the Thursday or Friday after the Sunday. Yes, that's right. So the police already have him in their sights quite early on, really. But that interview is such a key point of this case. And in some ways, it's the missed opportunities that come out of this interview because Atkins seems close to cracking. Like the pressure is on him within this interview. He's denying, he's denying, but he's talking. And that in itself is something that police don't always get. They don't always get a suspect who will actually speak and answer questions. But it's when the tapes are turned off at the end of that interview that is particularly enlightening. He's sitting there with a detective who then later claims that Atkins said to him, I want to tell you, but I'm scared what will happen to me if I do. And that really was the moment he was going to crack. But for whatever reason, the right tools were maybe not implemented, the right things weren't said and that moment passed and he didn't tell them what happened. How was his demeanour leading up to that point? You know, when the tapes are rolling, this is someone whose partner is missing, someone that's been in their life for a number of years. Did he seem beaten up, remorseful, longing, any indication of any emotion? No, no, there's nothing. It's stone cold. There's no compassion. There's no, yeah, even just as someone who's being interviewed in grief, in despair that their partner's missing, none of that can be seen in the interview. Was Atkins charged? He was. And I think this is probably the part of the story that people think, there you go. It's all there. Wrap I mean, up, all the episode. Yeah, thanks all, for listening. All the evidence is there. It's quite unbelievable that, yes, he is charged. He does go to trial for Matthew's murder. And yet, this case continued on for so many years after that point. Tell me a little bit about Mark and Faye in the meantime. They don't stop looking for their son, even though they're confronted with the likely reality that he is dead. What can you tell me about their efforts to find him? Yeah, it's heartbreaking when you think about this part of the case. And for me, it's gut-wrenching because I've witnessed them myself do this, but they spent years personally going out into the Royal National Park, which is where it was suspected that Matthew may have been buried. And they spent years searching there themselves. So they put so much effort into trying to find their son. They felt very let down by the police all through the process. To be honest, I think they started searching not that long after Matt's car was found. Like it was before Atkins was even charged. And so they were just desperate for answers. And I think they knew early on that Matt was probably dead. And so they used their own detective skills to decipher, okay, it was this kind of night with this full moon. The shadows would have been here in the Royal National Park. Where could he have got to? They used the fuel meter and when the last time Matt had filled up was. And to be honest, Mark is an accountant. So he was pretty good at figuring out the ins and outs of the radius that they needed to search. But they searched all over. They would take 
a pick like the one that was purchased at Bunnings out into the Royal National Park and literally dig for their son's body. For a bit of context to understand the kind of needle in a haystack of it all, what's the Royal National Park? Where is it? How big is it? How big is this search? Being undertaken, mind you, not by the authorities, law enforcement, trained professional investigators, a mum and a dad. Look, it's a huge national park. It's 16,000 hectares, which is probably difficult to visualise. But if you were to ever drive into this national park, there are that many entries, exits. There's so much forest just everywhere you can look. And so they were really trying their best to narrow it down. But, you know, there's a map at the front of my book, which I got them to mark up with little X's where they had searched over the years. And the Royal National Park is just dotted with X's. It's all over. They really were not leaving any stone unturned as such. Michael Atkins was charged and he did face trial in 2008. What happened at that trial? So the trial itself, I didn't know Mark and Faye at that point, but it was a really harrowing experience for them. It was a really long trial. It was a jury trial as well. So they were really worried from the start whether or not he would be held to account. It was a difficult trial in that a lot of the missed opportunities or perhaps kind of sloppy police work came to the surface There were just simple things like the fact that when Atkins was interviewed by police, they didn't do a proper warning. And so a huge chunk of his police interview actually got thrown out and the jury never heard it, you know, those really key denials. And so that had a major impact on the outcome. And, you know, this is also a time, I guess, whether you argue this is relevant or not, but The case didn't receive much media attention. There wasn't much of a public interest in the case. The police hadn't really given it the time of day. I mean, there were some good cops who worked on it, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't really a high priority case in any way, shape or form. And so, I don't know, is it surprising in those circumstances that a jury then found Atkins not guilty? I don't know what story they bought. It was put to them that Matthew might be overseas somewhere, that he may have been spotted elsewhere. They had all these, you know, different possible sightings of him that were brought forward as part of the case. The defence put up a theory that maybe it was a drug deal that had gone wrong and that Matthew's life was taken as a result of that. So there was enough confusion there that the jury did not find it compelling enough that Uh, he had been murdered by Michael Atkins. And so he walked. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with Grace Tobin about the death of Matthew Levison and his parents' decade-long search for the truth. So he walks away, an innocent man, declared by a jury, he's free. What happens to Michael Atkins after that? Where does he go? So Atkins moves to Queensland. He moves to Brisbane. Yeah, he's he's a free man. He's not an innocent man, but he's free. And he moves straight into the Fortitude Valley, which for those who aren't familiar with Brisbane, that's essentially the Surrey Hills, Oxford Street in Sydney. It's the comparable sort of area. It's where all the nightclubs are. It's where, you know, really the gay scene is as well for people living in Brisbane. And so Atkins lives in an apartment in the middle of Fortitude Valley and he quickly gets a new boyfriend who looked at the time strikingly similar to Matthew Levison. He's I think even younger, he's blonde, he's attractive, and he came with his own cohort of other young, attractive gay guys. If I can be so bold as to say this, 
Atkins does not strike me as a particularly charismatic or appealing man. What power do you think he had or has over these younger men? Yeah, it was certainly something I was asking the same question when I was writing the book and I really wanted to talk to people who might be able to shed some light on that. I did speak with some people in Brisbane who knew him at the time that he arrived there. And his hold over these younger guys was essentially that he would go out and he would shout them all drinks. He was the guy with money because he was older. He was full-time employed. A lot of the guys he was hanging out with were probably at uni or fresh out of school. So he is sort of funding their lifestyle. He's buying them shots at the bar. He's having them over for, there was this really disturbing photograph that I came across called Pool Party for Porn Stars, I think it was. And it was essentially this event that he hosted at his apartment block in the pool area. And it was all these really young guys in, you know, Speedos, around the pool and he just sticks out like a sore thumb in the middle of them all. They all look like they're in school still. And so that was really, I suppose, his attraction. He had this apartment that they would all kick on back at. He was offering them something that was quite a shallow thing. But I suppose when you're 18, 19, that is attractive in its own way. So Michael Atkins is living it up in Brisbane's Fortitude Valley. Matt Levison's parents are continuing to search for their son's body. When does a breakthrough come in order to reopen the case? It was hard won by Mark and Faye. They never gave up, not even for a second. I think the result of the trial winded them. It was so devastating for their family, but they just started trying harder than ever after that point. So they were out searching more, as you say, but they were also fighting for a reward to be offered for new information. They were fighting for an inquest then to be opened. And really that is the point that a new detective came onto the case. So the New South Wales police did agree to offer a small reward for information leading to a conviction in the case, knowing full well that really the only suspect was still Michael Atkins. That never changed even after he was acquitted. If fresh leads had come through, they would have investigated, but it was clear as day that he was the one responsible in some way. So the reward was there and from there they started pushing the police to keep investigating, to not let this case go cold. And the police make them that commitment, but it's not until a detective called Gary Jubelin, who most people in the true crime space are quite familiar with, Gary came onto this case. And it's during a time in his career that he describes himself as being at a bit of a loose end. So he'd recently taken quite a long break. He'd been off work for about 12 months. And he came back to this essentially untouched file on his desk. And he's working out of the unsolved unit at the time. And he's kind of annoyed, to be honest, that nothing's been done with it. He was aware of the case before he went on leave and he comes back and it's still there. No one's picked it up and run with it. And so Gary being Gary, almost out of frustration, sort of went, I'm going to hit the ground running on this one. And so he starts following up other leads that have come in through Crime Stoppers. There is one lead which is kind of a dog leg to the whole case, but they do go out and investigate some fresh information that came about through an ex-boyfriend of Atkins. They exhaust that line of inquiry though, and that in itself is a huge disappointment for the parents. And it's kind of from there that Gary thinks, well, let's try and take this to an inquest. And so then it becomes about trying to get an inquest. And for those who aren't familiar with inquests, they're very different sorts of procedures to a criminal trial in that it's inquisitorial. 
more evidence can be heard, different types of evidence can be heard. And it's about trying to find out the cause of death rather than getting a conviction. So it's 2014, Gary Jubilin is brought in, the inquest is happening, you come into Mark and Faye's life. It feels like everything is happening all at once, all of a sudden after years and years of almost nothing. Yeah. And look, I think it was a point in the case where, yes, there was this absolute gun detective on the case, which gave Mark and Faye, you know, reason to feel comforted by the fact that someone was taking care of it. On my side of things, I'm promising them you can have a 60-minute story. We're going to look into this. We're going to put this case on the public agenda. But nothing in this case is easy. Everything took time and it did take almost 12 months after making them that initial promise before we finally got the story to air. And part of that was just jumping through so many different hoops, trying to get the evidence from the trial, trying to get the CCTV so that we could show people here he is buying the Matic in Bunnings. All those sorts of things took just so much time that at the point that the 60 minute story ran was actually on the cusp of the inquest. And so it was all kind of gathering speed at that point. And I think really that was crucial timing in a way because the story ran and it had a big reaction at the time. It was just this very mysterious kind of unsolved case where here's the partner and here's the evidence. And the inquest had only really been set down for four days at that stage. So it was going to be kind of straight in, maybe hear from the family and about their loss and then a kind of open finding potentially as to how Matthew had died. This was their last ditch attempt to get answers. They fought long and hard to get the inquest approved and the fact that it got set down at all for an inquest was a big win. But then at the same time, it was disappointing that it was only going to be for four days because what can you do in four days? They weren't going to really call any witnesses apart from the family themselves. Michael Atkins wasn't going to be called. It would have just been the police and the family really, and then an open finding. And I think that is probably where in some cases it does make a difference that the media take an interest. And I think having this big 60 minute story that came out with an interview with the parents, all this compelling footage, there was public outrage over the fact that this guy seemed to have got off. And so lo and behold, the inquest suddenly gets expanded into then weeks, well, initially weeks. It ended up running for years and the media interest in it became extraordinary. It was like, a circus every day I was down there. And so for me as a journalist, that was one of the times in my career where you can really just see the impact of putting a case like this in the public spotlight. That must have felt extraordinary for you, having spent all this time with Matt Levison's parents, anyone who watches that 60 Minutes, you know, they come across so sincere. They could be anyone's mum and dad is the sort of feeling I had watching them. What was that like for you that you've put all of this effort that you've promised them that people will know about their son to have then the inquest erupt? Oh, it was amazing. It was what you want to do as a journalist. It's why I'm in this field to have that kind of result. But at the same time, it still felt very unfinished at that point because here we had all of this amazing evidence and all this momentum going, but then everything was hinging on the outcome of this inquest. And there were still so many unknowns at that point. Standing at the start of the inquest, it seemed inconceivable that Michael Atkins would provide any answers because of the way that inquests are run. He wouldn't necessarily have to. Even if he got in the stand, he was going to be able to say that he objected to giving evidence because anything he might say would potentially incriminate himself. So many inquests I'd been to before the Leveson inquest, 
that's what happened. Persons of interest would just get in the stand, they'd say those special words and the coroner would excuse them. And so really at the start of the inquest, there was this kind of anxiety around, well, will it actually do anything? What was the goal of Mark and Faye ahead of that inquest? Was it about justice and holding Atkins to account or was it about finding Matthew? It was both. They were their two goals. They wanted Atkins prosecuted. They wanted him held to account for what he had done, but they wanted Matthew's body back. And that second point was really so important to them. One of the most fascinating and harrowing aspects to this story is the compromise that Matthew's parents face between those two goals. What can you tell me about the considering of a bargaining arrangement with Atkins? What did that mean? So really the bargaining arrangement with Atkins came at a point in the inquest where it had been going on for some time. And so the witness list was exhausted. The police had put forward everything that they could. The family had been heard, I think, at that stage as well. And it would have still resulted in an open finding if Atkins didn't take the stand or if some new information came through. And so that was really where former Detective Gary Jubilant honed in on. He knew that to have any result from this, they needed Atkins to answer questions. And so as I sort of highlighted before, the thing about inquests is that persons of interest can be asked to give evidence, but they can still just get in the stand and say that they object to answering any questions on the basis that the evidence given would tend to incriminate them in an offence. And then if there are reasonable grounds to that objection, a coroner will just excuse them from evidence. And that was exactly Michael Atkins' plan. And so that's where the first deal with the devil as such came in. So Jubilant and his team devised a strategy, which they then took to the Leveson family. They planned that when Atkins objected to giving evidence, there was an option available to the coroner to grant him a certificate under Section 61 of the Act. And really what that meant was the certificate would provide him with immunity from prosecution for murder and for any other criminal offence for that matter. The only things that he wasn't immune from were perjury and contempt of court. Everything else, he could get up there and say, I shot him, I strangled him, I buried him here, and he was covered. He could just leave that day. And so it was extraordinary, the idea of doing this. And Mark and Faye and their other two sons were affronted. They just couldn't believe that this was being put to them. But really, in some ways, it was the only way forward because if he didn't take the stand, there was no chance of answers. The problem was that he still didn't take the bait. So even though they decided, okay, yep, we'll go ahead with that part, you can give him that option of immunity if he talks, which was a very difficult decision for them, but he still didn't do it. So he got into the stand, he still refused to give evidence. So then the next option was for the coroner to compel him under her powers to say, well, you have to give evidence. And so this is all very legally tricky and it actually took months to resolve because it had never been done before. It was unprecedented that a coroner was putting a person of interest in this position. And so his legal team argued that he shouldn't have to do that. He lost all the appeals. So we essentially get to a stage where we're back in the inquest. He was forced to take the stand. He did have the immunity deal, but then he still lied for days and days. So you can imagine for the parents, this is just dragging out and dragging out. The one good thing about Michael Atkins' lies is that it's what eventually caught him up. It's what eventually 
got him <laughs> stuck in his own web and he perjured himself in the stand. And so he told one too many lies and then he accidentally admitted to telling one of the lies and there they had him potentially on a perjury charge. So then that's when the second deal came in. So the parents were then asked to choose the impossible. They finally had Atkins in a position where he could be convicted for up to 10 years for perjury. So he would go to prison. So do they take that choice or do they give him an, a deal that says, we won't jail you, but in exchange, you have to show us where Matt's body is buried. And so it's an impossible <laughs> choice, really. Hold to account for something or find their son's body. They shouldn't have been put in that position if the justice system had worked perhaps in the way that people hope it works. But for them, it, I mean, I'm struggling to find the words because it wasn't a choice. It was such a difficult decision. They, mm. they didn't want one over the other, but they chose to find their son's body. And a big part of that was because they didn't want that burden on their other two sons. They say themselves, they didn't want to die and leave their other two sons still searching for Matt. So that's why they chose that option. Gary Jublin says that there was nothing traditional about this investigation, that bargain, that deal that was put on the table in two different iterations was unprecedented. The parents should not have been put in that position, as you say, but did it pay off? Did they find their son? They did. And that is the most extraordinary part of this case, that after 10 years of grief, of searching, of having no idea what happened to their son, they found his remains in the Royal National Park buried by Michael Atkins all those years ago. Where he was found and your map from the Levisons with all those X's dotted from all those nights that they spent trying to find him, were they close? They were very close, yeah. They were certainly in that area at one point in time. So I don't think they would have found him though because in the end where Matthew was found, it was actually through taking out this quite small palm tree. It was, a, as it turned out, 10-year-old tree and that had actually grown out of the site where Matthew was buried. And so they probably themselves would never have found him because they weren't going to be taking out trees. And I don't think it would have occurred to them that that's where he would have been buried. But, yeah, they were pretty close at times to being near where he was buried. Did Michael Atkins give any more information aside from that location of where Matthew's body was? Yeah, so when it came to him describing where he had buried Matt, he was taken out to the Royal National Park by the police and his lawyers were there as well. They drove around for some time before he finally sort of settled on this particular spot and he walked about 70 metres into the bush and kind of came back and said like he was quite sure that that was the location. And the police were sort of baffled because I think they thought that was a long way to be dragging a body essentially through the forest. And so I think they were sceptical at the start whether the location was right, but they dug up the area anyway. And in the first search, which took I think it was about 10 days they didn't find Matt's remains. And so then it was back to the drawing board. And so this process went on for some months where they took Atkins back to the Royal National Park. They actually even got Matt's car, which Matt's brother owned then at the time. And so they put Atkins in Matt's car and got him to really reenact the night and try to rejog his memory as to where he'd taken him. He kept coming back to that same site. He also identified a second site where Matt may have been. So they dug up that site as well. And we're talking, you know, excavators, like huge 
heavy machinery in the parklands and digging up trees and shrubs, all sorts of things. And so this was a very long process. The police got him hypnotised at times. They got him to carry a full mannequin into the bush to try and like see whether that jogged his memory. They went to an extraordinary effort to try and figure out where Matthew was buried. And so as it turns out, the first site was right. Atkins was so sure it was that site that they decided to re-dig it. And there were sort of 30 centimetre gaps the first time round that they dug up the site. And so they went back and trawled over every bit of earth. And it was the final day of the search in the final hour that that little palm tree was actually accidentally knocked down by an excavator and they found his remains there. What was learned about Matt's final moments from that discovery? From Matt remains themselves not much because too much time had passed and so there really wasn't much forensically that they could figure out from the discovery which remains probably the most disappointing part of this case is that there's no independent evidence as to what happened to Matthew how he died All we have is Atkins' version of events, to be honest. That's really the only version that exists from one of the two people who were there that night. And what is that version? Was that revealed once he knew he was either going to be in prison for perjury or that he had to come up with the details about Matthew's location? What did he say? Yeah, so he was interviewed as part of that deal, part of the deal was show us where you buried Matt, but also tell us what happened that night. And so Atkins provided yet another version of events, which is why Mark and Faye remain extremely skeptical about this version of events. But Atkins' version is that Matthew came home that night, he was pissed off at Atkins, and that when Atkins woke up the next morning that Matthew must have overdosed and that he found, you know, a bottle of the drug GHB on the bench and that maybe Matt had free poured it and taken too much and had died and that he then panicked that he felt like he was going to be blamed, that he felt like there was going to be so much shame attached to him and guilt attached to him and, you know, that he didn't want his mother knowing, all these sorts of reasons as to why he then decided, well, instead of calling an ambulance or the emergency services as perhaps most normal people would do, he decided to go and bury his boyfriend. What do Matthew's parents think happened to Matt? They think he was murdered. They believe that he was driven to his death that night by Michael Atkins and that he was killed by Michael Atkins and that that is for them the only reasonable account of what's happened to their son. They just simply reject, they completely reject Atkins' version of events. And he is a free man today, Michael Atkins? Yes. So we don't know much about his movements right now, but our understanding is that he's still living up in Brisbane. I was speaking with Mark and Faye last week about this and they do get trickles of information from time to time from people and there have been some sightings of Michael Atkins still in Fortitude Valley, I think at the train station and some other places. So he still seems to be getting around. I'd say he's probably keeping a low profile, but at the same time, if he's targeting guys of the age group between 17 and early 20s, then this is a next generation of young men who possibly don't know anything about this case. Is there any hope that new evidence could come to light that could ever see a murder charge brought again against him that we might ever find out more on what happened on that night? I mean, you never say never, but 
I don't think that as far as Matthew's death is concerned, that there's much more that can be done. Who knows? Maybe new information one day, maybe Atkins himself says something one day, maybe someone does know something from that time who's been too scared to come forward. It's possible, but as far as a fresh charge goes and fresh trial and conviction, then I think that's fairly unlikely at this point. What does it tell us about the families of victims, the insight that you've had working closely with Mark and Faye, that in the wake of a tragedy, they would ultimately rather find the body of a loved one and have closure in that sense than know that a killer is held to justice? I think it tells us more about the justice system, to be honest. It tells us that the justice system can be appallingly unfair for the victims of crime and their family. You know, as we've said, the Levisons shouldn't have been put in that situation. But on the other hand, the system had already failed them personally at that point. And so Jubilant was trying to push the boundaries as far as he could to at least get them one of their wishes to find their son's body. And so that was unfair that they had to do that. But I think if they hadn't have even got that, it would have been worse. And I do know from knowing Mark and Faye, they hate the word closure. Like you never want to mention that word to them and to really most other families who are in this situation. It's not about closure and they certainly haven't achieved that. But I think I've seen a, a new sense of peace in them. I've seen a, a, a different side to Mark and Faye since they've been able to find Matt's remains, have a funeral for him actually lay him to rest in the way that he deserved and that it was with dignity, it was in a loving manner, it was in their own family's way. That has brought some sense of peace to them, but I can't lie, like it's frustrating as hell for them and for anyone who's had anything to do with this case that there was no one held to account. Even if you don't believe that Atkins killed Matt, you know that in the very least he has buried their son and he's lied about it for a decade. Thanks to Grace for her insights into this case. Her book, Deal with the Devil, The Death of Matthew Levison and the 10-Year Search for the Truth is linked in our episode description if you'd like to learn more about Grace Tobin's work. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. The executive producer is Gia Moylan with assistant production by Cassie Merritt. Our audio design is by Rhiannon Mooney. Mamma Mia is dedicated to telling powerful stories you won't hear anywhere else, like the one you just heard. Help us keep sharing these stories by subscribing today. There's a link in our show notes. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.